what drives gender inequality? Is that just pure discrimination or it also has um, some roots in the productivity differences? Um, and what I find is that you actually have both, right? So this discrimination, it definitely has a role in, in those later outcomes when, when there's no more productivity differences between men and women. Um, but the origin of this discrimination does also go back to the initial productivity differences. I am an assistant professor at London School of Economics. Um, so before, I have also worked at Northwestern University in the UCLA, and I spent a little bit of time at, at Brown University. So I have been mostly an, an economic historian. I've done work mostly on China. But then I think within this niche, I've really developed an interest also in gender. So some of my work has been trying to like, further pursue in both of these directions. The research on culture and institutions has received a lot of interest in, in economic growth, especially. I mean, the reason for this is because uh, as time goes on, economists really realize that in our current explanations for economic growth is rather inadequate. So even after you're taking into account all those factors around capital, labor, human capital, there's still a lot to, is left unexplained. Just as a in quick intuition, I think this is actually the old idea that we think culture it, you know, varies across societies and somehow it might have been the predictive of some of the important outcomes. But this idea has only been uh, more rigorously examined and, uh, both in theoretical and empirical ways in like, the past you know, 10 or 20 years. So there's many reasons for this. Some part of this is because there has been more data available. Um, but partly of this is because some of our pioneer thinkers, you know, people like Avner Greif and the, um, the, on the theory side, but like Nathan Nunn on the more of the empirical side. So that is, I think, combined all those forces and it has been like, a huge wave of interest in, in, in the very, um, a growing literature on those topics. So um, when economists you know, think about culture, if we look at the most recent 10 years of literature, it's, it's mostly about you know, values, beliefs, and customs. Uh, I think I would say the, the values and the beliefs are even more important because those are things that shape how you think and then how you make decisions. And in a way, usually it's been implied, is in a way that is non-standard or you know, deviate from rationality, which is some assumptions that traditionally economists would be uh, adhering to. So that component of the, the belief system has attracted a, a lot of interest. Uh, what people have been doing is trying to study, so A, its origins, where it comes from, and then its impact. Um, and sometimes we're also trying to just trace the, the evolution of those values and the beliefs. Um, and then, as you can see, there is like a, a very nice uh, intersection between this type of uh, work, you know, cultural economics, and economic history, because economic history gives you all these tools and, and access to the archives, and, and, and those are all ways to, to make this study is, is more rigorous and, and more um, based and, and grounded in facts. Um, so yeah, so th I, I think there has been a, a lot of challenges, of, of course, because as you said, those are concepts itself are pretty hard to measure. They have like, you know, different people have different ways to think about it. But I think as we have tried and, um, you know, it's like a consensus building process right, over time. And, and there has been a, a lot of achievements work, but also just like uh, solving those methodological challenges as we go. Um, I, I think it is uh, still very promising literature. There's like a lot to be hopeful uh, in the future. So the basic story, right, so, what happened is in China you have traditionally just you know, household, a base, very basic ec economic, economic model. You have like men and women uh, specializing in different tasks and, and they both had to pay you know, those in-kind taxes to the state. So that is the background. And then around 1300 there has been a, a technological shock and, and this like, benefited woman uh, in this very, very unique way. And then I exploit this shock and then trying to, to measure its impact over time. So a lot of what's work is trying to first to identify all those conditions uh, near the shock so then I can have some idea about how how, uh, how this technological shock affected this economy um, and then in which ways it affected women's position uh, in the absence of other you know, complications. And then it traced it over time. So initially the paper is rather simple. It just like looked at the very end and look at the, the 2000 census and the effects of this cotton revolution um, and sex racial imbalances. And then as I think about it more and I realize that 
it's also important to be able to document all these changes in between. And then the paper started to incorporate more elements um, and it has effects and outcomes in uh, 1600s, where I looked at how it affects widow survival. And then it's also in the 19th century, um, and the time period in between, um, some of this goes into the, the bride prices versus the dowry. So um, I find that the Cotton Revolution uh, makes it more likely that uh, men will be paying the men's family, <laughs> will be paying a bride price to, uh, to the women's family, which is also consistent, um, broadly speaking, with, with this view that in the Cotton Revolution, uh, by increasing women's income, then also increase their bargaining power in the marriage markets. And then uh, some of the other findings include, especially in, after we had no cotton revolution, the economic effects anymore, how does that uh, affect, uh, are those reflect, effects re being retained or not? So what I find is that um, in the relatively free, uh, free economy context, free market context, you see this cotton revolutions, so, um, the after effects of this cotton revolution continue to increase women's labor force participation, which means they are like more likely to be in the labor force and, and not just in cotton textiles or cotton textile sector, but in like, all sectors um, across the board. But then also, um, even in the more stringent conditions, which is the state socialism era, I mean, you can assume most of these decisions are uh, you know, being taken away from the private individuals, which also means their beliefs and values. All those economic effects would have very little impact on all those outcomes we care about. But even so, that we still find the cotton revolution has an effect on, on how likely women become the head of the household. So that is, at that point, I think it is uh, one of the pieces of evidence that is uh, super convincing. It does seem to be the case that the colonial revolution has managed to transform the beliefs about women um, and how competent or able they are uh, relative to men. So the areas with the Cotton Revolution are more likely to hold this more egalitarian view uh, towards women and more likely to think uh, they're just as capable as their male counterparts. Um, those are the core findings of the of the study. Um, yeah, so I, I so the reason I, I think I like the project a lot is I, I do think that it's um, it it is it is one of those cases that economic history is is showing like so much promise and, and able to answer like important questions in in both labor economics and development economics in the sense that it answers this like age old question about like what what drives gender inequality is that just pure discrimination or it also has um, some roots in the productivity differences. Um, and what I find is that you actually have both, right? So this discrimination, it definitely has role in, in those later outcomes when, when there is no more productivity differences between men and women. Um, but the origin of this discrimination does also go back to the initial productivity differences. So I think this is just, you know, I think this you know, echoes some of the points raised in and Cheryl uh, Lundberg's recent work also in, in a similar vein um, about how we think about gender inequality in, in labor economics. But then in development economics, as you know, that there is um, this, a lot of efforts trying to understand the, the effects of um, having those cash transfers to, to women and, and how does that affect in, um, or both you know, positions at home, but also uh, in society. And the historical shock that the China went through is, is going, has a very good chance to inform the larger, uh, the broader profession that about you know, some of the most important questions that we care about. The literary inquisition in China is an, uh, so it is a phenomenon that happened mostly in, during the Qing period, which is about 1600 to 1800. So during this period, we know this historical background of you know, the Han Chinese population uh, subject to the the, you know, the new control or the new ruling of uh, of the Manchus, who were seen as also is a different group. Um, then I think the tool they exploited at this time to in order to solidify their power, which was was to uh, really trying to. Uh, uh, the keep the Han elites or the traditional literati uh, under control. Normally, I think of this as a, as a pretty quiet group as it is because they don't really have any independent political power. Um, but what one thing they could do is to uh, to you know to have a discussion about all those issues, you know, which is indeed something happened a lot in just before the Qing came along. 
And this creates this space of intervention for the states, which is, which is they can just actively impose these rules about you know, what, what should not be uh, in the discussion at all. And then some of the methods they, they employed is to uh, making sure that all this, any of these cases where any of the uh, su su suspected speech will have to be reported. And th this resulted in a very long time period of uh, most of the people just being extremely careful about what they say in public and to people who they do not know. So I think that is why there is a, a pretty persistent long-term effect that I observe in the data. Uh, so what I do is then taking those snapshots of different time periods and using uh, various different ways to proxy this uh, latent variable, which is the beliefs uh, towards the strangers and the ability to, to cooperate among, um, among the ordinary people and the elites themselves. And then what I find is in places where they witnessed this wit literary inquisition, um, which is literally just having speech crimes and having illicit speech and being punished, they are much more likely to, uh, they're much, much less likely to be able to organize uh, the local charities. And later on, I also look at their ability to provide local public goods. Um, so the variable I look at is the, uh, is the schooling provision. So they're less likely to be able to provide schools. And then this affects, uh, after continuously documented this effects, which existed throughout this period. Then eventually, at the modern time, what I find is that the literary inquisition also reduces the interest in political participation. Um, this is even true for the very local level participation. Like, you know, how likely you'll be uh, on the board of some community engagement. Um, how likely uh, people will be uh, thinking their, their influence on this policy making uh, is, is anywhere close to being meaningful. Um, so, yeah, so this is just trying to piece together different empirical uh, facts and, and the data from like very different time periods and different parts of the country and to put together this picture of uh, the long-term effects of the literary inquisitions. And to me, I think the study um, is, is mostly trying to, um, so when I started this, again, this is also a project I started in grad school. Uh, I mostly, I, I think it's coming from my sympathy for the literati class, I, which has a lot of good things about it, but it, again, it's also a group that has suffered a lot of trauma uh, for various reasons, both in uh, imperial times and in more, more recently. But then the more I work on it, I also realize this is um, where, you know, you see this dynamics between the state and the civil society, which actually plays out in the long run. And as the state predates on the civil society and the civil society gets weakened, then that is how eventually the autocracy becomes more in entrenched. So some of this, I think it's, it's um, yeah, economic history again has this potential to, to inform um, some of the higher level questions that social scientists has just been very interested in. Um, for various reasons, and, and also just like for more modern, um, you know, from the Trump time to the more recent, um, all these discussions about the states and the autocracies, I often find in those ancient, you know, seemingly ancient and remote events is continue to be a very and, and providing useful insights and, and to shape our thinking of the more recent events.